So Ethan, we've been hearing recently more and more talk from researchers recommending and talking about the healthy benefits of psilocybin uh, from hallucinogenic mushrooms on the healing and rebuilding of neural networks after things like a uh, traumatic brain injury or a severe uh, trauma. Um, and you know, most of the, the, the crossover media, they're just saying psilocybin, mushrooms, isn't that crazy? It's good for you. And they kind of, you know, handle it at that level of superficiality. Um, but folks often ask me, what is going on in the brain? Like at the cellular level, what does the psilocybin do that helps heal or regulate or expand the neural network? Uh, would you break that out? As a neurologist, I figure this is, this is right up your alley. Uh, well, you know, I've been delving into this area for decades, actually. But the fact is, and uh, at the end of 2018, we still don't know exactly. Oh, wow. The conventional answer is uh, that psilocybin and related tryptamine psychedelic drugs work on the serotonin 2A receptor. However, that is not an adequate explanation uh, for the effects that we see with these drugs because there are other drugs that work on the receptor that don't have any similar kind of activity, particularly the kinds of prolonged benefits that we're seeing uh, now in controlled uh, clinical trials. Uh, psilocybin has produced um, great benefit in end of life um, issues for people with um, terminal illness, particularly cancer. Um, additionally, uh, it's shown long-term benefits on treatment of intractable depression, where even things like uh, electroconvulsive uh, therapy or shock therapy mm -hmm. have been unsuccessful. But that's with full psychedelic doses um, of these agents. Uh, we have a phenomenon now that's been, become quite popular in our society um, of using very low doses of subtherapeutic doses uh, of psychedelics, what's called microdosing. So this would be a, a dose that doesn't produce um, uh, strong alterations in consciousness, but um, has led to people feeling like they have greater levels of insight, greater levels of creativity. Um, we don't have a lot of proof of this, but we have hundreds of anecdotes uh, that support this kind of thing. Um, there are enough clinical trials underway now with positive results that support the idea that in the not too distant future, another schedule one drug, uh, psilocybin is going to be an approved pharmaceutical. Um, so there's a great deal to be learned here. Uh, in the 50s, before psychedelics were outlawed, uh, there had been a lot of therapeutic research, both with psilocybin and with LSD. Um, but um, in a manner analogous to what happened uh, to cannabis, all the biomedical research stopped in the 60s when they were outlawed. And we've seen this slowly come around in the same way that uh, there's been a resurgence in therapeutic cannabis research. Uh, so interesting times will follow. Yeah, for sure. And, and I understand um, from your paper that um, not only do you hold that, um, that do, using microdosing can help uh, heal and kind of reconfigure the brain after traumatic brain injury, um, but that using it in, uh, in concert with cannabinoids ca can actually be better than either of them alone. How do you normally uh, suggest that cannabinoids would be paired with psilocybin for maximum benefit? Well, this is conjectural. Um, we don't have any studies uh, of the two together. Uh, one of the phenomena that is common uh, with the psychedelics in high doses is uh, at least a phase of nausea which is easily counteracted uh, with cannabis. But um, in complex psychiatric conditions, uh, I, I could see the potential uh, for combinations of, say, low-dose uh, psilocybin uh, in conjunction with a properly constituted cannabis 
base preparation, preferably cannabidiol predominant. Um, but we've got to get one over the finish line of approval and then see um, more in a controlled setting of what the combinations might really accomplish. Mm -hmm. I think it's going to be interesting too because as you said, we don't actually know what the psilocybin is doing in the brain. We've got pretty good ideas, but the, the research has been quashed, but hopefully seems to be coming back now. Um, but we both know that, that you know, self-healers and psychonauts are going to be going down this path alone. Um, uh, before the science catches up, since the science has been held back by regulation. Um, would you offer any uh, cautions to people who want to uh, pursue this kind of solution on their, on their own, um, considering you know, neither, neither mushrooms or cannabis are dangerous, but you, know, you might have some uh, cautions around dosing, perhaps? Uh, absolutely. Uh, I'd emphasize that uh, this should be done in the right environment. Set and setting are critical. Uh, nobody should engage in using a psychedelic uh, unless they're fe feeling reasonably secure, are in a safe and calm environment, and absolutely um, in the presence of a responsible person who's not uh, engaged in the same activity. In other words, a guide. Uh, anything else is overtly dangerous. The danger of any psychedelic is that someone is going to have uh, produce a panic experience. Um, and this can be really, really traumatic. So I would never downplay that. Um, but in terms of direct toxicity, no. Mm -hmm. But uh, certainly psychotrauma uh, is possible. And the best advice is uh, to proceed with extreme caution um, it's much better to use too little than too much. Um, uh, if a person exceeds uh, the threshold of what they can handle, they're going to have a bad experience. It's going to last some hours and uh, it's not going to be remembered um, as a good idea. Yeah. Um, so, uh, again, uh, they have to engage in judicious dosage. Uh, in a proper setting with very good uh, supervision. When you use, use the term microdosing, um, what are you actually talking about? Because you know people people are usually talk about dosing in the you know the regular citizens rate, the non science environment by weight, right? <clears throat> and you know whether or not you're having getting your psilocybin from cubensis or cyanessens, they've got different potency themselves. So you can't just approach um, mushrooms by weight. So if somebody had an idea though of how much active ingredient was in their mushrooms, how much are you looking for to be a microdose? Well, a threshold dose for a psychedelic experience with, with psilocybin is about 20 milligrams and this can vary. Um, so something well under uh, 10 milligrams is going to represent a microdose and uh, could be much lower than that. And as you mentioned, if someone's uh, doing this directly with mushrooms, it depends on their potency. There are things written about the expected potency of specific species, uh, and they vary a great deal. It could be 1% um, or less um, psilocybin in cubensis. It could be as much as 4% in psilocybin azurescens. Um, but uh, without knowing what species you have or anything else, um, I would always have people, if they're going to go down this path at all, and let's emphasize that um, these agents are still Schedule One and illegal in the United States, um, but if they're going to go down that path, uh, they should always err on the side of too little rather than too much. Mm -hmm. uh, go uh, s start low and go slow. Right. This yeah. is the same adage that we use in relation to cannabis dosing. Right on. Excellent. If you want to hear more about this, uh, there's a link in the first comment to the podcast episode that Dr. Roos and I did together. Thanks a lot, Ethan. Thank you.